Right. Good evening. Welcome to the West Shore Photography Club's Monday night meetings, June 3rd, 2024. This evening, we have a really exciting guest, Alan Ross, who is an assistant to Ansel Adams for five years. His program is Ansel Adams in Focus. But before we start that this evening, we want to give us some updates on the West Shore Photography Club. We had a field trip this past Saturday to Surrey Brook Gardens. Elaine, Elaine Shook, could you give us an update on that trip? Oh, I muted her by accident. Sorry, Elaine. <laughs> uh, okay, can you hear me now? We can yes. hear you now. Okay, it was a beautiful day. Um, there were 10 of us that showed up. Um, the weather was perfect. Uh, the gardens were beautiful. Unfortunately, because the weather was so, almost too nice, uh, the sky was very bright, although there were some beautiful clouds that were perfect for photography. But uh, the light was harsh. So there were some very heavy shadows and, and very bright skies. Without a polarizer, it was almost impossible. Fortunately, I had mine with me and um, put it on from the very beginning and was able to alleviate all of that harshness and uh, was able to get some pretty good photos. Um, but it was just a delightful place to visit. Um, not only are the gardens beautiful, but there are some very interesting historic buildings there with antiques inside and whatnot that you can go in and photograph. So there's a lot of variety of things there. Uh, the owner is very gracious. Uh, she came out and met us and gave us a little bit of a history in the property and um, how long it's taken them to develop it and whatnot. So it, it was a wonderful trip. Okay. Thank you, Elaine. Appreciate that. And Mary, Mary Fox, we have a trip coming up to Italian Lake, and I know you've talked about this before, but can you give us an update on why this particular trip to Italian Lake is going to be special for us this time? Yeah. Um, this time we're going to go in the late afternoon instead of like a morning shoot. So we should be getting a lot of really good evening or um, uh, blue, t blue light and stuff like that, or the blue hour stuff. And it should be really nice because Italian Lake is so pretty and so quaint. It has a, a red bridge that connects one side to the other. There are houses that actually face the lake. I want one of those houses. <laughs> and you can walk around the lake and you can see backyards. And uh, there's a fountain in the center. I can't think. I think it was Milton Hershey was presented with it and his wife didn't want it there. So they put it in Italian Lake and it, it's very beautiful. And hopefully the water will be. Um, the waterfowl will be working that day, but it should be really different, and I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, great. Thank you, Mary. That's yeah. on uh, June the 22nd, on a Saturday. Uh, we have an upcoming meeting with uh, Savannah Della Camera, and that is her true name, on basic sky photography, Milky Way, Moon, Star Trails. And this is uh, Night Photography 101. And this mainly is for folks that are going to be outside of our local geographical area because night photography here kind of is not too good because of the ambient light that we have and the pollution of uh, light pollution. So if you're going out of town, like up into the, uh, the, the coast, to the Atlantic coast, up to Acadia, going out west, this is a going to be a real basic kind of how do I do this with a, a cheat sheet that you can take with you. And then we have an, a reenactment at Landis Valley Farm. It's on a Saturday in mid-July. We're going to be going there for a club field trip. And uh, they have, it's an old, it's, it's a, a restored farm. Um, and they will have uh, reenactment uh, personnel there. And all the buildings will be open with pe people in period dress. And then we have Karen Cummings, one of our members. She's going to be uh, presenting black and white street photography. And we hope to follow that up with a practice session on the subsequent Saturday. And just as a general information, we're going to be holding back on Monday night meetings for the summer um, because uh, the attendance, people have things to do and vacations to go to. And uh, we'll be starting back up again full stream in September. But we have lots of other trips in progress, so stay tuned. 
But on to our evening session that we have tonight, Alan Ross, who was an assistant. Oh, so, Joe, yes. Joe, pardon me. Do you want to give Cam just a minute? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I said I was going to do that first thing, and I lied to you, Cam. Please, go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Thank you uh, for inviting the Frederick Hammer Click um, to this meeting. We really appreciate it. Um, I would like to say that those of you who are not used to having an interpreter in a meeting, it is most helpful if anyone who can to please turn off video. That makes the, the squares larger for the interpreters and those who need to see them um, possible. So if you would turn off your cameras, and I'll do mine soon, um, that would be very helpful for our interpreters and those who need to see them. Um, thank you, April and Weston, for coming to this meeting this evening. Um, I also want to thank the, a number of you who, A, have joined the Frederick Camera Click, as a number of our members have joined West Shore and probably other camera clubs as well. Um, and thank you for those of you who participated in our juried show. We just closed the entries to that on May 31st. Mike Donovan can tell you how hard it is to pick 80 out of the number of phot photos that are submitted we had 359 images entered this, this year and from 80 different photographers. We are very pleased with that result. Um, the jury, our juror is taking a look at those and notifications will go out J uh, June 15th. And if you are either um, get something into the show or just want to come see the show, uh, it will be at Frederick Community College all summer, pretty much, starting July 13th. And that's when we will have our um, reception and awards. So uh, come to that. Make a nice night, have dinner out in Frederick, and come and enjoy our um, opening reception. So um, that and, and just a brief thing for our members next week, the 13th or 12th, I think, whatever the Wednesday is, we're going to do a, a get together with framing and um, display options for uh, photos besides putting them on Facebook. So thank you. Thank you, Cam. Appreciate that update. Okay. But camera's see. off. <laughs> okay. So we for are me, We are fortunate to have Alan tonight with us. And as I mentioned many times, he was a, a an assistant to Ansel Adams for about five years. But however, Alan has a, uh, a, a large gallery collections in the Georgie O'Keeffe Museum, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Huntington Library, and he has his own workshops uh, where he uh, will take you through the process of printing images, as well as field workshops like in Yosemite, which is where was he was his was his backyard for many years. So you might want to check on his website after tonight's presentation, but you got to go there quick because I, from what I can see that they sell out very, very quickly. And um, so Alan is also going to talk about tonight his his signature image, Bridal Veil Falls in the Storm. You saw that maybe on the invitation, which is an absolutely stunning photograph. So we will be recording this. We will be password protected. We're going to be holding questions until about the mid of our uh, of the session. And, uh, and of course, at the end, we'll take questions, too. So with that, I'd like to introduce Alan Ross. Alan the floor is yours. All right, Joe, th thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about <clears throat> Ansel. Can I uh, share my screen here? Yes, please do. All right, here. Let's see here. I'm going to just start this here. And whoops, I think I've got a. All right, I got to share this screen. And then I'm going to be doing it from the other. Okay, so we we have your Zoom session screen. There you go. It's perfect. All right. Perfect. Well, anyway, okay. So I'm going to be talking about Ansel. Um, and one of the things that I like to do is to talk about the Ansel Adams 
that I knew as really a friend. Um, I worked, I assisted two workshops uh, with him in Yosemite before he hired me full time. And uh, in 1975, uh, as part of my being his assistant, I started printing his uh, Ansel Adams special edition prints that are uh, 29, actually, well, there are 30, but 29 available uh, photographs of Yosemite. And I've been printing his original negatives now for 49 years. So um, I worked for him full time for five years, but I was still commuting to Carmel for another five years after that. And uh, I was there in the dark room printing uh, the special edition prints uh, just a couple of weeks before he died. I sent, sent prints over to the hospital for him to look at. So uh, my five years really is more a little more like 10. <clears throat> Once again, I apologize for my voice. Anyway, uh, Ansel was really just a, uh, he was more than a photographer. Uh, you know, he was a, a friend. But I'm going to talk about the Ansel Adams that I knew, not the one that did Moonrise Hernandez, not the one that did Clearing Winter Storm, uh, but just, a, you know, Ansel Adams as a person and as uh, someone who cared very much about the environment and other people. So uh, here we go. Uh, this is Ansel and me at Point Lobos, uh, I think back in 1977 um, during a workshop. And... Uh, you know, we we really enjoyed doing workshops together. Uh, here's uh, Ansel and three of his assistants. Ansel, and then next to Ansel is Ted Orland, who was Ansel's assistant uh, during and and, uh, and before I was hired. Uh, and Ted was working. Uh, Ansel had no no concept of a day off. Ted was working Monday through Friday, and I was hired to work Friday through Monday. Uh, and uh, Ted uh, went off on his own in, in 1975, and uh, and so I was it at that point. So there's Ted, there's me, and then John Sexton over at the side here. So anyway, uh, that's uh, a little bit of background, and uh, here's another bit of Ansel Adams that I like to share, and one of the things is that I like to show this as an example of maybe why Ansel Adams wasn't best known for his color photography. Um, he really loved uh, loved being a bit of a clown in a lot of ways, and uh, he loved dressing in in you know crazy combinations of clothes and stuff like that. And uh, so this is just a you can look at the smile on his face. He was always very easygoing and just just loved being around people. So a little bit about Ansel's background. Um, Ansel was born in 1902 in San Francisco. And uh, this is one of Ansel's photographs from 1930 something, 32, before the Golden Gate Bridge was built. But this is a lot, uh, in many ways, very similar to the to what Ansel grew up with looking at. In fact, uh, this photograph here is a, a photograph made from Ansel Adams' boyhood house. The house was built in, in 1903 when Ansel was a year old. And uh, so this is what Ansel grew up in, in basically kind of wilderness, even though it was San Francisco, there was a lot of open space all around it. Uh, and this is the house that that picture was made from, looking out towards the Pacific here. But uh, in 1906, after the great earthquake, uh, Ansel, uh, the house was, was not injured in the earthquake or anything. And Ansel was going up these front steps and a, an aftershock hit and threw Ansel on his face down on top of the steps and it broke his nose and, and <clears throat> injured him a little bit more. But uh, being the, the emergency of the earthquake, the parrots couldn't really get much done about Ansel's nose or anything at the time. And then when they could talk to a doctor, uh, the doctor said, well, why don't we wait until he matures and then we can fix the nose more properly. And in Ansel's own words, he liked to comment, well, my, I never matured, so my nose never got <laughs> fixed. And this is a photograph that uh, Imogen Cunning, photographer Imogen Cunningham made of Ansel uh, well, with the purpose of showing how his nose forever looked over his left shoulder. Um, but at any rate, Ansel was uh, a complicated young man. He, uh, he was full of energy. He would have been really hyper uh, by today's standards. And in 19... Uh, 15, 16, he wound up getting quite a, some kind of a nasty 
cold or disease of some sort and was taken out of school and he read a lot. And during this uh, recuperation, he wound up reading a lot of books about the Sierra and Yosemite and the beauties of the land. And so when he recovered, he talked his parents into taking him to Yosemite on, you know, on an extended little vacation into the boonies. And Ansel's father gifted him with a little box brownie you can see in his hands there. This photograph was made a year or two after that trip, but that's the camera. At any rate, uh, when they went to Yosemite in 1916, when Ansel was 14 years old, uh, this is a photograph from Ansel Adams' very first roll of film. And it's really pretty, pretty nice considering he's 14 years old and has never made pictures before. But uh, at the time, and then in the teens, saying, ah, oh, Yosemite was not the national park that it is now. There were a lot of other businesses and stuff, and there was even a place where tourists could take their film and have it developed, and you'd get your film back. And so Ansel took this roll of film in to have it developed, and uh, when he picked it up, the uh, the the guy that that had done the work said, oh, I'm very interested in this 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 these pictures that you took, but I'm especially interested in this one picture. And how did it come to be on the upside down on the roll of film? And Ansel thought for a minute and said, Well, um, I think I was sitting on an old log and it fell down, and I must have taken the picture as I was falling <laughs> off the log. So you can see Ansel makes some fairly decent photographs falling off a log. It was easy as that. Uh, so at any rate, uh, I think that's rather funny. But another thing about Ansel Adams is that he started teaching himself how to play the piano when he was 12 years old. And his father was right, quite impressed and had had him start taking piano lessons. So even, even that period in 1916, when he was uh, 14 years old and going to Yosemite, he'd already been playing the piano a little bit for a couple of years. And uh, and anyway, the Yosemite trip was, you know, a very powerful thing for him. And so uh, he started going back to Yosemite every year after that. And uh, he started getting in touch with people in the, quote, Sierra Club and getting interested in that. And so in 1920, uh, Ansel Adams wound up spending summers in Yosemite as a custodian at the Sierra Club LeConte Memorial Lodge, which is this stone building off on the on the right here. And uh, but Ansel, being 18 years old now uh, and still in love with piano and be becoming more and more interested in photography, he'd been studying it in San Francisco and learned how to develop film and had got a got a bigger camera and and stuff. But uh, being in Yosemite for the summer, or much of it, he wanted to be able to practice piano. And he asked around and see if there's somebody that, uh, you know, had a piano that he could use to practice on. And uh, you know, people came up and said, well, I think there's this painter named Harry Cassie Best, who has his summer studio in, uh, in Yosemite. And I think he has a piano. So why don't we ask him? And Harry Cassie Best uh, said, well, yeah, no, I'm fine with him coming and practicing on our piano. That's that's really great. So that was a real turning point for Ansel in a lot of ways. So his trips to Yosemite were not just love of, loving the landscape and loving photography and photographing the landscape, but it was also a chance for him to really stay connected to his music. And even better than, than that is beside Harry Cassie Best having this piano, uh, he also had a daughter named Virginia, and here's uh, Virginia Best uh, yeah, with her mother in Yosemite Valley. This is an autochrome plate that uh, Harry Cassie Best did, and in those days, one had to send the film to Europe to get it processed, and I was looking through things in Ansel's uh, negative vault one day, and I came up after he died, and I came across this plate, and I asked his wife, Virginia, this little lady, uh, and later in life, was Mrs. That became Mrs. Adams, and I uh, asked her if I could make some sepachrome prints of it, and she said, "Oh, I'll absolutely go ahead." So I was able to make little prints of this photograph for the family. So anyway, I uh, Ansel is in love with Yosemite. He's in love with the music. He's in love with the Sierra Club and the the high country, and he's starting to fall in love with this this girl Virginia. When uh, when Ansel was there in 1920, she was. 
Uh, she was 16 at the time, but, uh, you know, as she got older, they were getting closer and closer. So anyway, with all this extra time in Yosemite, Ansel started going up on pack trips with the Sierra Club and photographing uh, in large form, medium, large format and all over the place. And um, had really acquired quite a collection of, of images. And one day he went to a party at a friend's house and uh, there was a person there at the, at the friend's house named Albert Bender, who was uh, an insurance broker in San Francisco. But beside that, he was uh, a patron of the arts and was very well connected to, highly connected to uh, people in high society in, in San Francisco and in the art world. And so uh, Albert Bender was quite impressed with the photographs that Ansel had been showing him. Uh, you know, pictures, you know, this is from 1923. So Ansel was 21 years old when he, uh, yeah, when he did this. Uh, here's some of these early, early photographs, 1921. Ansel was 19 years old when he did this. Soft focus, but it was one, one photograph that really lasted over the years. He did uh, this one on a trip up to Half Dome. Uh, this is uh, a photograph that he made on a place called the Clouds Rest, which was where Ansel had been made his, his famous photograph, Monolith, the face of Half Dome. And this area is called the Diving Board, and it's a sheer drop-off from this edge that you see here. And I think maybe you might see a little figure on the, on the distance here. That is Virginia Best. Uh, she was uh, pretty nervy herself. She was... Uh, she even brought a movie camera along on this particular climb and uh, photographed Ansel making his wonderful photograph, Monolith, the face of Half Dome. And this photograph in particular was a turning point for Ansel in his photographic career. It's 1927. He's 25 years old. He's got a six and a half by eight and a half inch glass plate camera with him. And he's got a couple of plates left. So he sets the camera up and makes this photograph on the left of monolith, of the face of Half Dome, and using an orange filter, which at the time was kind of the ex accepted way that if you want to have a little mood to the sky, you use this orange filter, and that's that. Well, so Ansel made this photograph, and he had one plate left of film, and he thought, you know, this isn't really quite how I feel about this subject. I feel that it's much more dramatic than this. I want something different. And so what he did is he visualized the, the stronger photograph. So he took the orange filter off and put a red, very strong red filter on and made this, this photograph. And this was a turning point for Ansel in terms of visualizing an image that was different from the way nor people normally would look at things and uh, what the expectations were of treating a photograph like that. So <clears throat> having all of these photographs together, uh, at this this party where Albert Bender was there, uh, Al Bender says, well, well, Ansel, you ought to do something with these these photographs. They're really wonderful. You should maybe, you know, sell, pick a selection of them and sell them as a collection of, of your your photographs. Well, at the time, and, you know, you know, 19, whatever this was, uh, 27, 28, something like that, 27, uh, photographs were still not considered anything like art. You know, that wasn't it. So Ansel um, somehow invented a term he called Parmelian prints. <clears throat> and at one point, so Ansel kind of washed out of high, out of uh, regular school when he was 17 years old. He didn't, he just didn't fit in with groups and stuff. So his father had him tutored and in a variety of things, math and art, science and arts and and so on. Ansel could read and write Greek, and so he um, he invented this term Parmelian prints. And uh, Albert Bender got on the phone or whatever and started contacting his clients and saying, "Our friend at Mr. Ad Adams is putting a collection of his his Parmelian prints together, and I'm buying a couple of sets. How about you?" So it turned out that Ansel wound up having essentially sold this entire set of, of Parmelian prints before the, the prints were actually even all made. So uh, that was quite a, a beginning for Ansel in his photographic career. 
But this fellow, Albert Berent, Albert Bender, was also not only connected to the creative community in San Francisco, he was also very connected to the art communities in Santa Fe and Taos, New Mexico. And uh, in 1927, um, that photograph monolith, uh, Face of Half Dome, was done in, in April of 1927. So this is later in the year, probably closer to fall. Bender talks to Ansel and talks him into uh, going to New Mexico with him. And uh, even Virginia Best tagged along. And uh, they were they were married in early to, uh, 1928. But 1927, they were still uh, just an unmarried couple, but uh, traveling together. And uh, they went to New Mexico and met all kinds of, of artists. Um, there was a woman there, that uh, a rich bank heiress that was collecting artists like George O'Keefe and John Marin and D.H. Lawrence and so on. Um, and so Ansel started getting connected to this, this community and started photographing there. But it's interesting to me that uh, he was there in 1927 and 1929 and all of the photographs that I know of that he made during those 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 trips to New Mexico, none of them were landscapes. They were they were tribal, you know, you know, dances. They were <laughs> artists, uh, Native American artists. They were people. There were there were his photographs were cultural. Uh, they they weren't mountains and so on. They were crosses. They were missions. They were just people with pots on their head and so on. So once again, they get back to San Francisco and Albert Bender says, you ought to do a book of these photographs, Ansel. And so in 1929, he gets um, Ansel to start putting some more photographs together and they publish a book called Taos Pueblo. And uh, the, the photographs in the book were actually printed on the same paper that the text was printed on. And it was coded by a, a photographer in San Francisco that was making photo paper. So it's a pretty amazing thing. <laughs> but these are, uh, these are some photographs from that portfolio, from that book. Uh, this one's not uh, Taos Pueblo. It's the branches to Taos Church near, near the city of Taos, but uh, not part of the Pueblo. But uh, but still a wonderful issue and thing and you know all kinds of people you know George O'Keefe had painted it and actually Ansel returned to Taos in 1930 after the book was out and uh, he met Paul Strand a photographer who was visiting in Taos at the time and Paul Strand and Ansel started talking together and Strand was photographing and developing film but he wasn't making any prints. And so Ansel's looking at Strand's negatives and uh, Strand's love for photography and something clicks in Ansel and he decides that he really thinks he's going to make the his, devote his life uh, financially, at least to photography instead of music, which was really, you know, quite a quite a great, great step. So he goes back to San Francisco and tells Albert Bender that I've decided to be a professional photographer and I hangs his shingle out and Albert Bender gets on the phone, starts talking to people about saying our friend Ansel Adams has got his name out as a photographer for hire. And uh, <clears throat> he starts off doing a, a whole bunch of portraits and other professional work. And this is one of his earlier photographs, which was really panned by the New York East Coast photography people about how it's it's just cold and icy. There's no personality to it, and blah 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 blah. But Ansel was really a people person, and he he loved photographing people. But in this particular case, this was more of a, a Greek sculpture. It was more of a classic sculptural portrait. But then he goes ahead and does another portrait um, here of ah, see, lost my mouse here. Here we are. Another portrait here, eight by ten negative, very, very moving. I mean, this is this is hard, anything but a cold, heartless portrait. Um, really, a, a amazing photograph, and now a, a Mexican muralist in New York at, at an exhibition. And uh, Ansel had the guts to take a four by five camera and just stick it right in from Jose Clemente Orozco's face in 1933. Once again, anything but a but a casual, you know. So less the you know important portrait um another muralist in san francisco 
uh, mixing paints. The muralist said, oh, well, I'll be with you in a minute. And Ansel's looking at the guy and said, no, 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 you just stay there. I want to photograph you just the way you are. And then uh, <clears throat> also through these connections in, in Taos and Santa Fe and so on, he wound up meeting Georgia O'Keeffe. And they became friends and went off. And there's a 35 millimeter portrait that Ansel did of Georgia O'Keeffe looking like she's rather teasing this wrangler here. But... Uh, Orville Cox, but uh, at any rate, this is a totally classic photograph with not a large format camera. It's a 35 millimeter and Ansel is just, he's just pulled off a fabulous thing. Um, there was another uh, depression age photographer, Dorothea Lang, that was famous for photographing, you know, you know, the really the poverty and the distress that people in the depression had been suffering and so on. And uh, then after that, in 1944, thereabouts, uh, she and Ansel were hired to photograph this trailer camp in the San Francisco Bay Area of, you know, people that were trying to find some decent housing or couldn't or whatever. And Dorothy was photographing the people and Ansel was photographing the facilities of the camp and so on. And Dorothy says, Ansel, why don't you take some people pictures for Pete's sake? You've done some really nice things. So put down the big camera and go to do some people. And this is another one of Ansel's most famous photographs, or at least people that, that know the, quote, the other side of Ansel Adams. Trailer Camp Children, 1944. It's very moving. And, uh, you know, Ansel, like I said, Ansel was a people person and uh, went on. And then I mentioned Dorothea Lang. Um, this is her in 1965, just not not long, but she would just come out of the hospital and it wasn't long before she died. But Ansel got together with her and he had a twin lens roll, you know, Roloflex or something like that. And he was photographing Dorothea. And these are just this collection of portraits of her are just so tender and moving to me. It's just boggling. You know, the Ansel was a people person. He just, he loved having people around in the house. And uh, so we're, he's known for his landscapes and so on. But, you know, I think I've shown you some pretty, pretty really neat portraits and I'm not even totally done with that yet. Here's a portrait, portrait of his assistant, Lillian DeCock, who worked for him from 1963 to, to 72, she was the, the longest, you know, single full-time assistant with Ansel. And here she is sitting in Ansel's living room. And Ansel probably said, oh, Lillian, just hold on there, just sit there, and made this beautiful portrait. Uh, later on, Ansel was introduced to uh, pianist Vladimir Ashkenazi. <clears throat> and Ansel made this portrait of Ashkenazi. And Ashkenazi liked Anselism well enough that he decided he would do a personal performance on a, a, at Ansel's house. And here's Ashkenazi in Ansel's living room. And Ansel brought Ashkenazi brought his own Steinway piano. And uh, there's some Ansel prints on the background there. Uh, and the, the, the album cover down here says photograph Ansel Adams on the, on the corner here. So he, did, he even did album covers. But at that way, he still wasn't done being a professional. He made photographs for the Yosemite Park and Curry Company, the, the, the chief concessioner in Yosemite. And here's uh, a cowboy and Indian, a cowboy and cowgirl uh, actors, uh, I guess, between doing some kind of a little skit or something at the Glacier Point Hotel, which burned down in 1969. But those of you that can see it on the image, if I could bring my mouse over here, you'll see a white ledge picking up out of half dome on the on the on in the light here. That's the diving board, and right on the edge there is where Virginia Best was standing, and Ansel was standing on the face of this footing, photographing half dome. So that gives a little bit of extra drama to what Ansel did. But again, okay, skip the people. Uh, he's doing advertising work for a French bread company in San Francisco, and he has the idea of doing a double exposure. This is like in 1931 or so, but he was just, you know, he, he was fearless. I mean, went and did all kinds of wild things. Um, <clears throat> this is a little still life he did, uh, I think, just to show off his expertise at doing a little still life for advertising or food photography or, or whatever. And uh, if you've ever seen a big print of this, 
you can actually see these little wires of the egg slicer pushing down into the gloss of the egg and you can see highlights between the 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 wires of that the egg cutter i mean it's inc incredible what he did and even as late as the 1950s he started doing some work for ibm and i don't know just what this one is but this one is a photograph of transistor assembly and uh I was an advertising photographer uh, after Ansel and worked in the studio before Ansel. And I can promise you that this kind of photograph is very, very difficult to do. I think it was a Hasselblad image, but just incredibly well lit, well done. Everything about it is just spectacular. Another one from the same series. Um, and then there's this other one here. Uh, Ansel was friends with the, uh, the Hills Brothers family making coffee and in the, the late 60s they were doing uh the, the series of five pound coffee cans or three pound coffee cans that were uh you know had art on them so paintings and this that and the other thing as collectible things so that people would be tempted to buy their coffee and and keep the can around for you know for memories and stuff and so Ansel well sure yeah we can do this um and Ansel got no end of grief from the photo community in, in Carmel. Ansel had moved from San Francisco down to Carmel in 1962, and this is 69. So all the people there, the, the Weston family, the other photographers in Carmel, oh, Ansel, how could you do this? You sold out. Oh, you're terrible. And Ansel, well, you know, he got paid for it. and He liked the people, he knew them. And it's not a really bad job, actually. I have one of these cans. And I've been printing this negative now for pushing 49 years. Um, but at any rate, <clears throat> Nassau got no end of grief for having done this. But one day, a photographer friend of Ansel's uh, came in, in over to Ansel's house uh, to talk about something, photography, no doubt. And he walked in the door and uh, at one point, uh, Imogen Cunningham, photographer Imogen, had uh, sent a, one of these cans down with a, one of her students with a plant in it. And Ansel was, oh, that's really great. Thank you. Thank you, Imogen, so much. It's pretty. And Virginia Adams, was she loved plants, and so she was watering it stuff. Well, anyway, Henry Gilpin walks in the house and said, Ansel, what are you doing with that? And Ansel says, oh, isn't that lovely? Imogen gave it to us. And Henry says, Ansel, that's marijuana. You can't, they can't have that. And as it turns out, <clears throat> Henry Gilpin's day job was chief of detectives of the Monterey County Sheriff's Department. So Henry said, Ansel, I'm not going to do anything to you, but I've got to confiscate this. And, you know, I'm sorry. And um, as it happens, I know uh, what I knew one of Imogen's sons very well, and I knew I know one of her granddaughters, and they say absolutely that's true. She sent this pot plant down to Carmel and thought it was the funniest thing in the world. So at any rate, um, it's quite a collector's item now if you can find one. Uh, so Ansel still wasn't done with his professional work, and uh, here's a photograph he made in 1968 <clears throat> or 67. Um, he was hired. His last big professional job was for the University of California, and he was. They were having about to celebrate, celebrate their 1968 centennial, and they'd hired Ansel to photograph all of their campuses and outstations, and many or most of their different departments at the universities. And so here's Ansel Adams making art out of the University of California, Los Angeles, with a moon moonrise. And, uh, you know, here's Ansel that can do this. It's amazing. Uh, another one here where Ansel and his assistant Lillian DeCock are photographing this professor here. And I think I, think I recall that this box was full of, uh, of birds. Uh, and I think it was an ornithology uh, study here. Um, another one here is a drama class in the fog at UC Santa, Santa Barbara. Um, just really wonderful people acting out things in the fog and reading reading a play. Um, Ansel loved science and technology, and I'm sure he would have really got off on on this one, the science experiment. I don't know what it was, or uh, but uh, it's 
that not only a, a bit of a really impressive photography to be able to record all of the detail in this glowing sphere and all the wires and things around it, but to also you know get somebody looking at it with all the detail in the background, not easy to do. Um, and then here's a, uh, a, a telescope at Lick Observatory and Ansel was also very enamored with astronomy and other parts of science. And so um, and I've had, a, had the opportunity to print this exact negative. It's five by seven. And the tonality in it is absolutely exquisite. This really an amazing job. And this one, I can say that this is a class change at University of California, Davis. And I happen to know when it, when it was. Uh, this is in the, the winter of 66 to 67, because I had to print this negative once for the university. And, oops, there we go. And this fellow right here is me. Uh, I was at Davis at the time, and the fellow behind me was in my dormitory. Another fellow up here was in my dormitory. I knew a girl over here, and I'm about the only one looking at this guy. Well, a couple of people are, but little did I have any idea that I was going to be working for this guy six years later. Um, so anyway, so that was, that was Ansel's really big last job, but the war would <clears throat> showed a different side of Ansel Adams and it's really very, very impressive. Uh, he wasn't in, in, in prime uh, position to actually serve in the military at the time, but, uh, he was able to, uh, to, to take care of, of doing work for the military and uh, Yosemite and the Sierras were held as a line of first defense in case of a uh, Japanese invasion. So the, the military basically just took over Yosemite. And here's Ansel photographing the troops lined up in, in the village and under a, you know, the tree of the Redwoods and up at uh, what they used to call Inspiration Point. Now they call it Tunnel View, but Ansel called it Inspiration Point. And it'll always be Inspiration Point for me. But uh, so Ansel did this, but there was another side of what was going on. And then he did other photographs for the military, um, did photographing gun installations in the Bay Area and some other things like that. But also in World War II was the fact that a lot of Japanese Americans were being imprisoned because they were Japanese rather than being any threat in the war. And uh, Ansel had grown up with knowing Japanese people in San Francisco and then really loved and admired them. And he was horrified with these, these people having their property you know, taken away from them. And they were essentially incarcerated in, in you know, prison camps. Uh, this is one that was in California on the Eastern Sierra. This mountain here is... Mount Williamson, where Ansel photographed this big boulder field a few years after taking this. But this is all housing for Japanese prisoners here. And Ansel uh, happened to know the Secretary of the Interior at the time and wound up getting permission to photograph the people in Manzanar and photograph the, the goings on there. And uh, he made this book, Born Free and Equal, the story of loyal Japanese Americans. And so they include some mar marvelous photographs, this little girl, it's, a, it's her birthday. And so she's got this grin. And another reason for the, the grin is actually, there's another photograph of her smiling and she's missing a couple of front teeth. I mean, this is the cutest thing I've ever seen. Uh, here's a family who has a son in the army in Europe fighting the Germans, but they're locked up behind barbed wire and, that, and you know, getting guns in the Eastern Sierra. Uh, and another uh, family here, uh, this fellow is Toyo Miyataki. He's a photographer himself and was quite a very popular um, uh, screen photographer down in Hollywood. He was photographing movie stars and all kinds of things. But that wasn't that didn't count, you know. He was he was Japanese, so he and his family got locked up. And this is clearly at Christmas time because they got a nice tree up here, and I imagine they have have some other presents and so on. But uh, Toyo Metaki actually um, 
when the, he was imprisoned in Manzanar, he snuck in a, a film holder and a lens. And while he was there, he made a little wooden four by five camera. And with Ansel's help, he got, finally got permission to make his own photographs in, in Manzanar, so long as there was somebody in the military watching him do it. And here we have a photograph of the Office of uh, Reports and Free Press. Well, free press, yeah, I'll bet. Uh, you know, in this prison camp here, once again, this is Mount Williamson in the background here. Another one here, little girls, you know, waiting to go to school or something like that, just kids being kids, people having babies, just, you know, like the rest of the world, uh, people making art. Uh, you know, one of these panels still exists, and it's at the visitor center, and now what is the Manzanar uh, historical uh, national monument over in the Eastern Sierra. And these, these people, they wound up growing their own food. Um, you know, a lot of them knew how to garden and stuff like that. And so they were able to, to grow everything they need. And some of them were even in the military, but did, could they sleep someplace else besides barbed wire, you know, locked up, you know, prison camp? No, they can wear the uniform, but they got to stay inside this, this horrible thing. Uh, back in 2020, uh, I had the pleasure of <clears throat> redoing all of the Ansel's photographs of Born Free and Equal for a republication, a facsimile republication of the original book. And uh, unfortunately, being, you know, finishing the project in 2020, we weren't able to have parties or do anything like that to celebrate because of the coronavirus. But uh, the original, uh, these facsimile books are available at the Manzanar uh, Visitor Center and I believe the uh, Eastern Sierra Interpretive Association. Um, really, it's a fabulous bit of work. So another side of Ansel Adams, uh, his politics and notoriety. 1965, here he is at the White House when Lyndon Johnson has brought him on to the LBJ Environmental Task Force. Um, here he is in... Uh, in the yeah, in the White House in the Oval Office, uh, giving a a book to uh, to the Fords, uh, Ansel's sub uh, deluxe edition of his Images book that came out in 1975, and had a little custom print in it. And there's Ansel's business manager here and uh, Ford's photographer David Kennerly over over here making photographs. <laughs> yeah, and even at that time. Uh, President Ford's daughter, Susan, came out to uh, take a workshop from Ansel uh, in Yosemite in 1975. She'd taken an interest in photography because of David Kennerly and uh, came out here. And that's me between the two of them, behind the two of them there. Uh, she was a charming lady, uh, really delight to be around. And we're actually still friends on Facebook. Um Another friend I mentioned, David Kennerly, who was hired to photograph Ansel for the cover of Time magazine. And I happened to be in Carmel when uh, when Kennerly came down to photograph that. So I got to photograph David Kennerly photographing Ansel for uh, for the uh, for the, the cover of Time. It was really quite, quite great. Well, right after that, did you know, politics and so on. Um, when Jimmy Carter took office, he asked Ansel to make. Uh, if an official presidential portrait, the first time an official presidential portrait had ever been made as a photograph. And so Ansel uh, arranged to have it, <clears throat> apologies, arranged to have a 20 by 24 Polaroid camera brought down to the White House. And Ansel made this executive presidential portrait of Jimmy Carter here with a 20 by 24 Polaroid camera. Um, quite, quite the event. And uh, then in 1980, Hansel's getting the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Jim, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. And, uh, you know, so that's, you know, his, his environmental energy was just, it was nonstop. But uh, in 1980, 83, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Playboy magazine did an article on, on Hansel, an interview with Hansel, and uh in that, in the course of the uh, the article, Ansel was quoted as saying to something to the effect that he hated Reagan, 
And so, well, the phone started ringing and Mr. Adams, this is the White House. The president wants to know why you hate him. And uh, could he talk to you? And well, no, Ansel, I'm kind of busy. I'm, I'm busy. I'm not, I've got to go out of town. No, I can't do this. Well, <clears throat> well, this is after I still had my own business in San Francisco. I'd left Ansel full time, but I was still commuting down to Carmel um, to make special edition prints in Ansel's house. And the phone rang and uh, Mr. Adams, this is the White House. Uh, the president's going to be in Los Angeles tomorrow. You will meet with him. Uh, so Ansel uh, drove himself to the Monterey County Airport the next morning and flew down to La Los Angeles. And uh, Ansel, his dislike of Reagan was mainly because of Reagan's secretary of the interior, who really... Um, <clears throat> didn't suit Ansel's idea of environmentalism at all. So at any way, Ansel was supposed to have something like a 15 minute meeting with Reagan. And they wound up sitting here, this is a White House photograph. They wound up sitting on this bench for, for almost an hour with Reagan's jar of jelly bellies on the, on the counter here. But I was in Ansel's kitchen at, at his house in Carmel when he got home that day. And he walked in the door and said, the president's a very nice man. He'd make a wonderful neighbor. Uh, so that's the, that's what Ansel was like. He, you know, he had issues about Reagan's, uh, you know, attitude towards the environment, but he also recognized him as a human and that the fact that he'd actually done some, some other very fine things, uh, including uh, giving you know, uh, the payments back to the, all the people that have been imprisoned in Manzanar and the other relocation camps. So uh, Ansel, this is it. And, and, and an example of Ansel's humanity. Uh, now we have <clears throat> some real fun here, and that's Ansel's annex. And I'll go through this pretty quickly here. But uh, at any rate, Ansel was quite the clown. He just loved nothing more than a really corny joke. And here are some pictures that his wife Virginia took. Obviously, they're waiting for some party or something going on. And Ansel's in a tuxedo, but he's bored. And so he starts clowning around with these. And this is pure Ansel. There just there'd be nothing, nothing unusual about this. Um, here's uh, an excerpt from um, Ansel's autobiography in a note to photo historian uh, Beaumont Newall. And <clears throat> here's Ansel. Uh, saying the function of the light disturbing the halide is expressed in the following formula. EZ equals lambda times F to the O, O power, times COD sum of bang squared over poop. And it goes on. And for somebody that washed out of school when he was 17 years old, this is some pretty sophisticated knowledge of mathematics. Uh, but it's another example of Ansel's sense of humor. Uh, Ansel went uh, to Europe for the first time in 1974. And here's a picture of Ansel Adams and Jacques-Henri Lartigue and Brassailles in, in Paris. And here's another portrait that I did of Ansel and Yusuf Karsh in Yosemite swapping hats. I don't think Ansel's really the fedora type, uh, but that's uh, another story. But here's... Uh, Ansel, Ansel was never too busy to have some fun. And a friend of uh, Edward Weston's model and, and ex-wife, Karis Wilson, uh, knew this fellow at UC University of California at Santa Cruz. And uh, he was, a, you know, I, I guess a, a performance artist or something like that. So he had it in, this, in mind to dress Ansel up as Moses and photograph him with a tablet of 10 zones. And God said, let there be light. And he divided the light into, into 10 zones. And But Ansel just was never too busy to have some fun with this. This is a portrait I did of Ansel at his last Yosemite workshop in 1981. And, and uh, he had no, no qualms about looking in the, the other end of a lens. He liked clowning around. Here he is wearing some 3D glasses for a 3D program that Polaroid Corporation uh, had, was putting out. And then he's at this one here in the red jacket is on his way to a birthday party <laughs> for a musician friend of, of, of it, Ansel's, Rosario Mazzeo, who used to be first clarinet and hiring manager at the Boston Symphony. And... Uh, Anyway, so Ansel was invited to that, and uh, uh, and he came back, and 
there's uh oh god senior moment here this uh fantastic uh, uh conductor uh in new york was there and uh Ansel just complained about how this famous musician <laughs> tried to pound the piano through the floor. Uh, and uh, then here in 1976, Arnold Newman comes to, Calif to California, this part of a workshop, and he decides to do a portrait of Ansel. And I was, I was uh, brought up as, as Arnold's assistant for this one. So I'm handing film molders to Arnold while uh, Arnold's posing Ansel outside of Ansel's office. And then Ansel, after being after Arnold does this photograph here, which is on the back of one of Ansel's books. This is an Arnold Newman photograph. Um, oh, the, the pianist that Ansel was referring to was Leonard Bernstein, that Lenny tries to pound the piano through the floor. And here's Ansel having telling telling Arnold Newman a joke. And clearly this is total Ansel laughing at his own jokes and just he'd, he'd do this. He laughed just as hard the seventh time he told told this iron joke. So it was a real wonderful picture of Ansel. Uh, some snaps that I did of Ansel out in the field, just playing around, having fun. Uh, another photograph of Ansel, I guess, playing Moses or somebody else at a old ruin in Nevada. Um, and uh, I, he was being filmed by somebody else, and I did this portrait of her of him, and uh, just. Just wonderful to be around the whole time. And one of the nice things about Ansel was that he never let his notoriety go to his head. Uh, he always kept himself listed in the phone book. And uh, yeah, somebody could call up and say, Mr. Adams, would you um, sign my book for me? Oh, sure. Come on out at the end of the day. And uh, can I show you some photographs? Oh, sure. Come on out at the end of the day. He was very, very open. So anyway, a little quick picture of Ansel. This is his living room here with his grand piano and uh, getting ready to go out on a on an assignment, it looks like, with all his cameras getting ready here. Uh, here's a portrait I did of Ansel and Virginia in their living room one time. Uh, just that's, this is their environment. That's Ansel's uh, living room there in his office here. And just, you know, Ansel is just in a great mood the whole time. It was joy to be around him. Um, He'd leave these little messages on my desk every day in the morning. And uh, one of them was he had a, this battery powered thermometer in the dark room that I apparently kept forgetting to turn off. And dear sir, you left the thermometer on all night, Sniff. I think I will get you an electric rectal thermometer that you can carry around well, with, all, with all the time on and blah, blah, blah. Naughty boy, you didn't turn off the goddamn thermometer off. You have to say, a uh, hundred Ave Marias and got 93 goddams. I'm peeved, disappointed, discouraged. You did not forget to turn off the thermometer and I have nothing to gripe about, blah, blah. What is what life without a gripe? I mean, this is total answer. Uh, it just, just total, just fun, fun, fun stuff. And uh, he was always, like I said, hardworking. If he was on business, going up to a print shop in San Francisco, working on a book or something, he always brought along a typewriter. Uh, this is after I had left Ansel's, but I was still coming down to print. Well, Ansel wasn't feeling well enough that morning to get up and get dressed, but he was feeling well enough to sit in front of the word processor and, and work on his autobiography. Um, some real quick little, little things. That's the two of us in the dark room. And Ansel being Ansel, we're toning Prince in here and the phone rings and he's on the phone for a while. And then he comes back and we're toning, toning more Prince. Um, the little, little glimpse, quick glimpse of Ansel's dark room. Uh, uh, the two of us in there. Uh, I never wore a robe, but the guy that took the picture uh, asked me to. That's Ansel's eight by 10 and larger and all these chemicals in the background. And some of the fun that went on at Ansel's and while I was there, Imogen Cunningham coming down to photograph Ansel for the People magazine, and he photographed her, beautiful portrait of her, and one of her photographs of him. Uh, Georgia O'Keefe came by, uh, and I made the photograph of the two of them here. Um, and then a couple of photographs Ansel did of me while we were out in the field doing work. Ansel getting ready to go off on a, an earlier uh, travel thing he brought 
the everything with him. All these things are going in the car. Um, Ansel working on top of the car in, in the Sierra. Ansel cooking breakfast uh, outside of Lone Pine on the Eastern Sierra on, on the way up to Mount Whitney. And heaven only knows what he was cooking because he wasn't much of a cook, that's for sure. Uh, and me and uh, and Ansel in, uh, in Tucson, photographed by Minor White. Uh, I guess it was a windy day. But uh, one of the things that Ansel wanted to do, <laughs> excuse me, have a drink of water here. Well, yeah, I, I consider myself Ansel's last field assistant because in 1975, <clears throat> Ansel was starting to work on his portfolio seven, his last portfolio. And in each photograph, each uh, portfolio, he wanted to have an original out of the camera, four by five black and white Polaroid print. Ansel and Edwin Land were very close friends and Ansel had been on retainer to Polaroid for decades. And so here's Ansel out at Inspiration Point. And this is the photograph that he made at this particular instant. And then we also, and you know, one of the things that just blew my mind about Ansel was how we, he could see things. We'd drive down the road and he was just, you know, he'd say, well, pull the car over. I see something and I'm looking at, what well, is just a bunch of rocks up on the hill? And he pulls out this beautiful photograph. We're in the Bay Area. And we're driving along and he sees some poles in the mud, says, whoa, pull over and stop. And it tells me to get the camera out with a particular lens. And he puts this beautifully organized photograph together with nothing running into itself and, you know, just really wonderful. <clears throat> and working together a little bit. <clears throat> the upper left here is a photograph I made. Uh, in 1973, and Ansel and I were out in the road, on the road making photographs, and I told him about this road and the trees, and so here he is, he'd stopped here, now he's out with his camera, and he makes this photograph of the tree, and then um, another one that's fun, this is a photograph I did in Yosemite um, of Ansel's uh, heating oil tank for the ha his house in Yosemite, and uh, the house wasn't heated by gas or yeah, anything or or whatever it was just heating oil and here we are i think this is 1974 and then this 1975 ansel's back there and there here's ansel with his camera set up photographing the same tank and uh he does this polaroid print but he presented it upside down he just thought the arrangement looked better this way so i mean he was very uh energetic so at any rate uh that's kind of the end of my little chit chat about Ansel. Um, I've maybe gone on a few minutes longer than was was wanted, but uh, I hope it's uh, um, I hope it's been good for all of you listening. So we'll take a a quick break on this, and uh, and see what what we're gonna do here. So I'll stop my screen share and see. Uh, if anybody has anything to say, Joe, uh, once again, I'm sorry about my, my raspy throat. Oh, no problem, Alan. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. We really enjoyed it. See if anybody has any questions for you. Uh, anybody? Uh, I have a couple here in uh, in chat. Anybody uh, have any questions for Alan? Alan? David, do you have a question? Well, well, have... actually, Joe, yeah, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I didn't know I was on, but I, I do have a question, maybe a, a comment, actually. I'm holding a book here, Farewell to Manzanar, and I'm just wondering if uh, you know the, uh, the novel of a young Japanese-American who was interred in Manzanar, she wrote about her experiences uh, of uh, of uh, the internment camp and her family and so forth. Uh, I was just kind of curious if you ever heard about the uh, you know the book Farewell to Manzanar. Well, I'm not sure I know that one. There are several other books, um, <clears throat> but uh, and I'm glad there are these other books. Uh, and uh, actually, one of Imogen Cunningham's granddaughters uh, has put together a book uh, using some of Ansel's photographs and some of Dorothy Lang's photographs uh, on, on the Manzanar internment camp as well. So uh, there's there's quite a bit out there. 
Yeah, I'll uh, I'll get the uh, the uh, text information uh, to you through uh, either Joe or Dennis. It's a very fascinating great. fascinating book, and uh, you know it just came up uh, when you talked about Ansel Adams and Manzanar. I had no idea. <laughs> Yeah, it was a very moving experience to be with Ansel and uh, to just hear his feelings about Manzanar and uh, and all of that. Uh, so it's one of those things that I wanted to share, this other side of Ansel Adams. It's not Moonrise Hernandez or Clearing Winter Storm. Yeah, powerful presentation. Very, very nicely done. Thank you. Ellen, I have a question for you. Being yes, sir. A, being a camera club, we often talk about the zone system. So I wanted to ask you two questions. Did Ansel develop the zone system or did he do that with Archer? That's the first question. And the second one, is the zone system, in your opinion, useful today when we have uh, histograms um, and uh, home mapping? Uh, well, it's a, it's a good question. Yes, I've, so far as I know, uh, Anders, Ansel did, um, did co-invent the, the zone system. And um, yeah, the zone system depends on your own approach. The zone system can be used uh, in uh, in digital work, although a histogram really really can do it. But uh, yeah, I have some people that really want to want to play around with it, and you know, it's not as much of a tool in digital work as as it is with film. But uh, you can still use it to measure your highlights and. A lot of cameras have have light meters that, you know, they're computerized and all of this, but they may not be able to pick out the brightness of a small object be somewhere in the scene. Whereas with a spot meter, you can take a one degree spot meter and you could hit a really nasty highlight that you want to hold tonality in and bang, you just set it and you know how to set a manual exposure very quickly. So there is, there is, it does have some merit. Um, but I will say that the zone system is not a religion. It's uh, it's just something that if it interests you, it can really help you uh, get better exposures and understanding the light a little bit better. But you don't need it to make great photographs. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Alan? Alan, uh, this is Terry Long on a girl. I have a four by five speed graphic that I rebuilt and I'm having problems trying to set the curtain uh, for this, the, uh, yeah, the curtain in, in it. I don't know how to set the curtain. Do you have any place where I could find literature on that? Okay, so it's got a focal plane shutter with a curtain? Yes. Yes. All right. I wish I I uh, wish I knew uh, just how to do that. Um, uh, I really I can't I can't think of anything offhand for something like that. There's somebody that must know how to do it, but I'm afraid I don't. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Great presentation. OK, well, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, I had a I had a comment about an early photograph that you showed of Ansel's uh it was a hand behind a screen and you said you didn't know what it was right it, it's it's core from an early IBM computer okay it, it's probably it's uh it's uh wires uh strung between little magnets uh and it's probably less than 1k okay well thank you very much <laughs> appreciate it I'm I'm one of the dinosaurs that created the Y2K problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Any other All right. How are we doing here? Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, um, I think on behalf of the uh, West Shore Photography Club and the camera click. Uh, we would like to say thank you so much, Alan, for this presentation. We got a real insight into Ansel Adams and how he thought, and it was really, really informative to mm. us. Really, well, that's great. Yeah, and thank you so much. I think everybody, if you would uh, unmute yourself, we could give sure. Alan a really round of applause and thank him for, for the presentation this evening. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, thank, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Uh, just to remind everybody, this will be recorded and it will be password protected and we will send that out tomorrow morning, bright and early. And um, and to thank all of you for attending and thank you from the folks down at the camera click for uh, for joining us this evening. We had a total of 74 people at one point in time in this wow. presentation. So Alan, that, that was speaking about, they just all wanted to hear you and that's the highest number we've ever had ever at the West Shore Photography Club. Well, terrific. And thank you. It's a pleasure. Sorry again about this. <laughs> it's just... Oh, it's not a problem. Didn't all matter. right. Not a problem at all. Well, thanks, everybody, and uh, good photography, and we'll see you later. All right. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Yep. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> thanks again. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Very really nice. a privilege. Okay, to hear pleasure. You. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah, Joe, the uh, attendance was uh, impressive. Oh, my gosh. Huh? Yeah, very good. Helen, when I tell you that we've never had that high before, that was just as amazing. Oh, great. Yeah. Now, we promoted you pretty heavily, but people really wanted to hear Alan Ross. And uh, I, I was, it's a shame you couldn't get to show your Bridal Veil Falls. I love that image. That is well, so cool. What I'd like to just say about that is that uh, just – Photograph for the feeling inside you, not just what's in front of the lens. I mean, on that one, the sky was way brighter than than it looks in my print. But my print, I, I had everything I needed on the negative, but it wasn't the mood and the, the emotional tones that I wanted. It was okay. kind of like Ansel using a red filter or darkening the sky. So mm -hmm. uh, for the straight print of that negative on a grade two paper is kind of a bore. But uh, with a little bit of darkroom work, uh, it comes out the way I feel about it. Mm -hmm. Now, when you said a little bit of darkroom work, like how many hours would you spend in the darkroom to do that? Well, uh, I mean, I had a, uh, you want to give me five minutes? Oh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> yes. All right. Let me just come up with something here. Okay. All right. I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Okay, good. All right, you see this? Yeah. All right, that one on the left is a straight print on grade two, and it's got all the tones in it. It's got full full detail in the shadows. It's got full detail in the clouds up here. And this is the structure of light that existed when I took the picture but it isn't how I felt about it. And so what I wound up doing, I, like I said, I could not have made a better zone system negative. This has got it all. But okay. <clears throat> it wasn't the distribution of light that I wanted. So I used a higher contrast paper than a grade two to print it, to get more contrast down in the lower clouds. And then down here in my notes from 1980, I don't have anything going back farther than that. But I did a six second burn down in the top here. I did a six second dodge in these clouds here. And then I did a five second burn from the top right to down in the middle. Then I did a 25 second burn, sky burn up in here. And then I did another 25 second sky burn and another two second sky burn. Then another 25 seconds over in the top left corner and another seven seconds coming farther down in. And then I did a 15 second burn in these clouds and a five second burn over in these clouds and then a little four second burn in each corner. And so <laughs> my wow. basic exposure was was essentially nine seconds. And uh, did you think about that before shooting that? So were you yes. taking these notes as you're shooting in the field and planning what sort of dodging and burning? Yes, you're doing? I knew I was going to be burning the sky down. And as it happens at, at this workshop, um, I my was hot. I was there at the workshop to run the dark room for the workshop, and uh, so since I was running the dark room, I was able to develop my film the same just a few hours after I made the photograph. 
And I made this photograph three days after Ansel hired me at that workshop. So it was a good week. <laughs> oh, my God. Hmm. So, so did you look at the image on the left and then draw those notes before you went into the dark room? No, I just had to get in there and work with it and just work on just trial and error. And okay. so, I mean, this these are my notes for the finished print, but it certainly was uh, certainly a, it took longer than just. I didn't just do it this way. I had to try this and try this and try that and try this. And then this is what I wound up doing. Wow. <laughs> That's um, a fascinating system for summarizing your work in the dark room. Wow. Well, thank you very much. So I'll oh, stop okay. that share. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was... Okay. So well... I did get a chance to talk about Bridal Bell Fallen Storm. Yeah, yeah. you did. Yes, yeah. you did. <laughs> thank uh... you. Well, I enjoyed hearing the humorous side to to uh, Ansel. That was that was fascinating we are too. We're spoiled today. Oh, totally. We're, saying so we're spoiled. spoiled today. Thank you. Well, I just uh, I loved Ansel so much. I just wanted to show what he was like as a person and his caring and the fact that he was such a people person. And uh, you know, he'd ask for ask his wife Virginia, "We have anybody coming over to dinner tonight?" And she'd say, "No, Ansel." Oh, can, I, can we call the neighbors and see if they can come over? He just loved, <laughs> loved chatting with people, loved being well, around. I didn't know he was such a jokester. Did you, Joe? No, oh, no, no, no. He, he wasn't. He 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 loved it. He had a fabulous sense of humor. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank thank you very much, Alan. That was a fascinating presentation. We really all right. It. And like Joe said, that's the highest number of uh, attendees we've ever had in a Zoom meeting. Fantastic. Well, I'm yeah. I'm very happy to have helped out with that. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And we're going to uh, end the program now and um, take care and have a good evening. Okay. Good night, guys. Right. Weston, good night, everybody. Good night again. As take well care. As Ray and Susan All right. bye -bye. and Tori. Good night, yeah. guys. Good night. Bye now. Good. Thanks, Joe. Thank bye. you.